I'm Su Ho Fan, and let me introduce my, my work aliasing detection in rendered image via multitask learning. And given a rendered image for an organ engine, we can tell its quality through aliasing detection without needing a reference image. This process is known as non reference rendered quality assessment, or we call non reference RQA. And why do we need RQA? As 3D things become more complex, and how to blend balancing quality and power consumption is a critical problem. And RQA method provides a criteria to achieve this balance. Another advanced application is that RQA can use for like a variable rate shading, or we call VRS, which determines res resource requirements for each tile in real time. And uh, given a gain rendered image, Traditional RQA method require a reference image, as we can see on the right side, and to compute the metric like PSNR or SSIM for a quality assessment. But here's a problem that how to obtain the reference image. To obtain a uh, reference image, we have to know something like uh, critical data like 3D mesh, material, and lighting. Or we can simulate it through a high SPP ray tracer. But Acquiring the 3D information is challenging, and using a high SPP ray tracer is impractical due to its time consumption. Therefore, we need to indicate the quality of a GAN image without a reference image, which is a non reference RQA task. To solve this problem, we divide the GAN image into different tiles and determine the quality of each tile through aliasing detection. And the number of aliasing tiles indicate the image quality. And we focus on aliasing because they are a common and major issue in the rendered images. And most quality assessment work focus on the real world image. <coughs> Therefore, non-reference non RQA research is limited, and no public label data set for this task. And the four, first and the only non-reference RQA method for aliasing detection was proposed by Pandian et al. at HPG 2018. And they propose a simple CNN model and treat the rendered image like the real world cases and achieve um, accuracy of 17% on our testing set. And since there is only one uh, aliasing detection paper, we have to explore other areas for inspiration. And we need to notice a method in image restoration called FBCN, which focuses on JPEG compression tests using a multitask architecture. And their, their model reconstruct compressed image and predict QA factor at the same time. And we adopt this architecture to our task, slightly improve accuracy to 73%. And just a little bit uh, improvement. Yeah. And we observe that the artifact in FBCN and our work are quite different. FBCN target the JPEG compression artifact, which affect the whole image, as we can see the JPEG image right on the right side. And in our case, aliasing often occur at age, which means it's a local artifact. So our architecture must uh, defer to address this local artifact. And another observation about FBCN is that the multitask architecture also enhances the predictor and the green, green block we can see there, and through the image space supervision during training. And we can discard the decoder part during inference time, maintain a robust predictor without any additional computation cost. So our goal is to design a multitask architecture for non-reference RQA task, or we call aliasing detection task here. And we also need to design a data set generation pipeline since no public data set exists for this task. Here are key insights of our work. First, we designed a multitask architecture based on FBCN. And second, we include temporal information through motion factor, which can easily obtain from the GAN engine. And our, here's a contribution of our work. Our work proposed a novel multitask model for aliasing detection. And we also designed an automatic labeling pipeline for data training and evaluation. And our method achieved better results than other baseline as we can see on the table here. 
and we show the demo video to compare our method with baselines. In the red patch, we can see there is a different label from model prediction, and the green patches indicate the matching labels. And the accuracy of our baseline would change. And baseline, you can see on the bottom of there, bottom row, you can see the accuracy was rapidly changed. In contrast, our method was stable and the uh, highest accuracy due to its temporal information. And <coughs> in addition to quality assessment like uh, PSNR and SSI we mentioned before, other work focus on different inputs like a uh, rendered image or like uh, video. And however, this work requires reference image, which are difficult to acquire during inference. And other work focus on aliasing reconstruction, like uh, TAA or uh, FSR2. And something some use a uh, neural network to solve this question. But our focus is on uh, detection rather than reconstruction. Okay, our, our method utilizes the motion factor to warp the previous frame to the current frame and can care together to provide the temporal information. And our model proceeds through two branches, as we can see the blue, blue block re uh, reconstruction branch and the yellow block uh, classification branch, or we call prediction branch here. And our model takes additional information from the previous frame and predict and reconstruct simultaneously, with the prediction branch robust enhanced by reconstruction branch. And during training, <coughs> the output of a reconstruction branch is fed back to the next frame forming a recurrent architecture. But here's a critical question that, how can we ensure both branch integrate information effectively? The output of a prediction, predictor branch, you can see the confidence there, and we will further pass through some several NLPs and, and then through the reconstruction branch. Ensuring the reconstruction is based on the prediction. And reconstruction doesn't predict RGB directly. And we can see the decoded feature will pass through a network called kernel network to, to reconstruct the final result. And the goal of the kernel network is to make the training process faster and stable. And decoded feature pass through the one, one times one convolution and softmax layer and to predict uh, some three times three filters. And the final RGB was compute by passing the inputs through those filters. And how does the kernel network work? The kernel network works because the filter value from 0 to 1 since the softmax layer, and the output kernel is sizes 3 times 3, which reduces the search space of the model. And moreover, the final RGB output is limited to transform inputs using existing information. To summarize our architecture, first, we incorporate temporal information through the motion factor. And second, the, our model performs multitask. The reconstruction branch enhances the prediction branch through the image space supervision information. And third, we use the kernel network to make the training process faster and more stable. And here's our loss function. Our loss function consists of three different losses. The first is spatial loss, which is a simple L1 loss for reconstruction task. And second is the temporal loss, which provide, proposed by Thomas et al., which compute the temporal gradient of reconstruction frame and reference. And third, the BCE loss, or we call binary cross-entropy loss, which for the classification. And to train and evaluate our model, we have to ensure the data set is stable and unbiased. And we set a three-step generation process. First, we record a tra camera trajectory and save it into a CSV file. And next, we use the FSR2, as we can see, a capture frame buffer, under a capture frame buffer there. And we, we determine the labels by toggling the FSR2. And we re remove the randomness factor like wind zone or particle system for the stable generation process. Then we'll capture the necessary G buffers like RGB and motion factor here. And last, we crop the source image into small patches 
And if source image rendered with AA or we call it rendered with SFR2, the patches are labeled as negative, namely it's non-aliasing patch. And if the source image rendered without aliasing, anti-aliasing, or rendered without FSR2, we further determine that uh, the edge is on the patch or not. If edge are detected on the patch, that the patch will be labeled as positive, and then it's a uh, aliasing patch. Okay, here is an uh, overview of our data set. We generate our data set through the, from the Unity SS store, and we choose four things from it. And we use three of them for training tests and, and one of them for testing, ensure no overlap between the data set. And our baseline includes the first listening detection model by Pentia et al. and our backbone model at BCN. And the ROC curve shows that our, our method has a better classification result across in the thresholds. And we further verify metric like F1 score and accuracy by optimizing the threshold. The threshold is selected the point on the ROC curve that has a minimum distance to the zero one point here. And as we can see the table, our result achieved the highest score dif across different metrics, proving our methods improvement. And as our model is a multi-task architecture, we visualize the reconstructed result showing improvement <laughs> without compromising either branch. But we have to notice that our focus is on aliasing detection, not reconstruction. To further verify the benefit of uh, temporal information and reconstruction, here we, we set a different setting, like uh, we can regard the temporal information as uh, additional input since it had the previous warped frame for, as an input, and the reconstruction branch we can regard as an additional model since we added for the image space superficial information. As a combination, we have four different settings here. And first is CLS only, which is a simple classifier using a current frame to determine a, a liaison or not. It's just a basic, basic baseline for other settings. And, here, and we have the CRS recon, which add a decoder to CRS only. And we re robust the classifier through the image space superficial information here. And third, we remove the reconstruction branch and add the temporal information called CRS temp, which will enrich improve inputs with temporal information here. And that is our setting, which combine the temporal information and the reconstruction here. And here's the result of our, <laughs> our basic ablation setting here. And the orange lines in indicate the CRS only, and which is a baseline for other settings. And the green and the red line here indicate that both reconstruction and temporal information enhance the classifier performance, which and Combining these two elements achieve the highest score across metrics, like as we can see the blue line here, and demonstrate that our method effectively in integrate both type of information here. And in conclusion, we introduced a multi-task model that improved non-reference RQA tasks and combining in temporal information and reconstruction for better result. And we also proposed a labeling pipeline for training and evaluation. And our work is limited to training and testing on the same render effect. We, are, um, we plan to expand different effects like twin shading or like uh, photorealistic effects to verify our models for diversity. And we also aim to test dynamic scene in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Shimon. Really interesting results, really interesting work. Uh, do we have? So I saw the title of the 64 by 64. Is that specific reason for that? Or uh, if not, is that changeable? And what happens if you change the file size? OK. Um, repeat the question. Would you repeat the question? OK. And is that your question, like, why we set the tile to 64 times 64? Right? Yeah. OK, this is uh, two main reasons that 
the first work uh, as Pedia et al. is used uh, 64 times 64 here. And another reason is that the sh like the edge defined like mobile phone, the maximum tile is size is 64 times 64. So that's why we can choose the 64 times 64 here. I have one question from the author of the previous work who is watching us online. So uh, he is asking, um, how do you make sure the metric doesn't learn what you labeled in the ground truth data set, but uh, kind of, I guess for the future work, right, tries to learn more of a perceptually detectable uh, flicker, which is you know close to human perception. It's a kind of future work, open-ended question. Uh, uh, can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess for the future, right? Uh, how do you make sure that the metric is uh, kind of closer to human perception of aliasing? Okay. Um, uh, this question is quite hard. That it seems the current metrics doesn't focus on the like uh, aliasing this artifact. So we cannot tell that like uh, SSI or PSN, uh, those metrics can fit our human perception. So most of them you choose the uh, CNN model or we call neural network to solve this question to hope that can fit more than more to the human perception. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Any other questions? With that, that's the last talk of the session, so let's uh, have a coffee break and let's thank all the speakers again.